Amen. Please be seated. The Lord Jesus Christ, after his resurrection, in the giving of the Great Commission, instituted the sacrament of baptism to continue until the end of the age in the Christian church. He commanded that all nations should be made disciples and baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to be taught to obey all that he commanded. In the Presbyterian Church, we baptize all who join themselves with the visible church. That includes our covenant children who become members along with their parents, and that include those who profess their faith and so join the church. The sacrament of baptism, as you know, is a solemn admission into the church. The church is the body of Christ, the kingdom of God and his household. Baptism signifies and seals our engrafting into Jesus Christ, the head of this church. It is a representation and sealing of the covenant of grace and God's promises to those who profess faith in his son. It signifies and seals our engrafting into Christ, our regeneration, the cleansing of our sins. It is a sign and seal of Christ's lordship over us in our engagement to him. And now, Christy Weber, would you please come up here and receive the sign of Christian baptism. To those of you here present, as you witness this baptism today, I would like to call upon you to be mindful of your own baptism, to remember the promises that God gave you in that sign and seal, to look for in yourselves the grace attached to that sacrament, to remember the privileges that God has given you as a baptized member in his church, and to remember that God has set you apart from the world to be holy in a prized possession for him. And now, Christy, you've already taken these vows, but we're going to have you take these vows again today. Christy Danielle Weber, do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure and without hope save in his sovereign mercy? And do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel? Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes a follower of Jesus Christ? Do you promise to support this church in its worship and its work to the best of your ability? And do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of this church and promise to study its purity and peace? Let's pray. Almighty God, it is you who have given this sacrament, Lord. It is you who speaks and works and moves and accomplishes things. We ask now, Lord, that you would, by this sacrament, by the sign and seal of baptism, that you would confirm your grace, that you, Lord, would bless Christy, that you would give to her, Lord, an increase in faith and hope and joy. We pray, Father, that you would remove all of our sins from us, Lord, that just as water washes over the body, so you would wash away sins by your Holy Spirit, according to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Christy, we've been trying to get her here. We haven't been able to work it out. So glad that you're here. Get this right here. All right, you can just face the audience. And I'm going to, Christy Danielle. Okay, Christy Danielle Weber. Okay. Christy Danielle Weber, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you that we can do this sign and seal outwardly, Lord, that you give such things to your church. We are people who operate by our senses and our faith is weak, Lord God, without seeing signs. And so you give these two great signs of the Lord's Supper and of baptism to show us that your promises are true, Lord God. And so what we've done here today, how we pray that you would make it real in Christie's heart, that you would be sanctifying her, growing her in grace, Lord God, growing her in faith, and that all of us 
would again be reminded of the baptism that you have given to each one of us, Lord God, in sign and in seal and in reality by your Spirit. Father, help us to improve our baptisms as we again remember the sign, the seal, the promise you make to us, Lord God. And we thank you that we are not looking to some promise that we make, but it's your grace, Lord God, your sign that you give to us. And so we look to your power to bless us, to grow us, and to keep us. And so do this for Christy and for us all, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Christy. If you would now, please turn in your Bibles. We're going to begin in the book of Genesis, and I have three passages I, we are going to read together. And you will notice as we read them, all three of them pertain to the Lord's institution of marriage. So we will begin then in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 through 24. This is the word of God, and it has been written down for our instruction, so please give careful attention to it. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And they shall become one flesh. Our second reading comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 24, verses 1 through 5. Now, when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house, when she has departed from her house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband detests her and writes a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her as his wife, then the former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after she has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord. And you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. When a man has taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war or be charged with any business. He shall be free at home one year and bring happiness to his wife whom he has taken. We come now to Malachi chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. And this is the second thing you do, says the Lord. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying. So he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But did not he make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. For it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord remains forever.
Let's pray. Almighty God, you have given us life and breath and all things. You have given to us an eternal inheritance in heaven that does not rot or spoil or rust or be taken by moths. Lord, you have given to us more than we can comprehend. Therefore, Father, we offer to you this morning as an act of worship, as an act of gratitude, our tithes and offerings. We pay to you, Lord, vows of faith from our heart because of your goodness to us. Oh, please, Father, take these as worship. Take these according to our faith. Take them according to the everlasting merit of your Son. And in his name we pray, amen. You may be seated.
You may be seated. And at this time, children ages 5 to 8 may be dismissed for Kids Bible College. As the children go out, I do want to encourage you to make sure you stop at the 91-4 table after the service. Um, as Pastor Appleton said, we are so glad that Tara was able to be here. And you can be a part of that ministry. That's what this is about, that you can go back and find out ways you can financially support and ways that you can even take a sponsorship or pray. And uh, that's a great work, and it, it could really use our help. So we hope you will check that out. If the Lord leads you to be a part of that, you will be blessed. Now let's join our hearts together in prayer to our God. Almighty God, our Father, how we do rejoice to be in your presence by your Spirit and because of the righteousness and the atonement of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord God, we know as we come into your presence that you visit us, that you cause us to draw near, Lord God, that we lift up our hearts to you, Father, and you meet us and you bless us, Father. And we are confident of all these things and we are bold even, Lord God, to make requests of you because we trust in Christ, in his righteousness and not in ours. We know that in and of ourselves we are sinners. And every one of us in this room, Lord God, or everyone who can hear my voice, we still sin against you. We fall short of the glory of God. And if you were to let us go and walk our own way from this point on, we would not last, Lord God, even a moment, for we would turn away, we would sin, we would once again, make ourselves under your curse. And so we confess this to you, Lord. We confess our ongoing imperfections. We confess our ongoing rebellions. And we confess them, Father, with sorrow in our hearts that we still do what we know you hate and what by your grace we have begun to hate. And so, Father, cause us to truly mourn for our sins, to be ashamed of them, to turn from them, to hate them more. And cause us to hope in Jesus Christ, to be confident in him that as we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we praise you for that cleansing, Lord God, that fountain which is in Emmanuel's veins and ever flows to those who draw near to him. And so, Father, again, we thank you that you keep us, you bless us, grow us in your likeness, make us more like him, make us more effective in our service, in our ministry, in our joy, and in our glorying in you, Lord God. Give us your spirit evermore, we pray. And Father, we do want to lift up members of our church to you. We thank you so much for the good report for Patrick. And we pray, Father, that the drugs would continue to work, that you would cause the cancer to go in remission permanently, that you would even be pleased, Lord God, to completely heal him, Lord, would be our prayer. But, Father, we thank you again for, for the healing and for the effectiveness, and we just pray that it would continue, that you would bless both Pat and Linda, Lord God, as they uh, struggle uh, in this time, Lord God, of illness to some degree. And we, again, pray for your healing and for your blessing, and that spiritually, Lord, you would even use this to draw both Pat and Linda closer to you and to one another and to your people. And, Father, we do pray for the ministry of 91.4, Lord God. We thank you so much for calling Tara to begin this ministry, to do this work. We thank you for each one of the girls that you have brought to this place, Father. We know it was by your divine appointment that each one comes and that each one is brought. And we just pray that you would continue to do the work that you have begun, that you would continue to raise up godly Bible teachers and ministers, Lord God, to teach these women the Bible, to teach them your truth, and that you would send forth your spirit with this truth, Lord God, and truly transform, save, and sanctify these girls. And Lord, again, we thank you for all of those who are doing the work over there. Bless them, Lord. Continue to cause them to draw near to you and to do this work for Christ's sake. Glorify yourself. Protect the ministry there. Protect the girls. And again, Father, continue to draw many to you and let this place be a light in the midst of this nation, in the midst of this dark region, Lord God that Christ's word and truth would be going forth and that people would be getting saved and that you would be changing lives and transforming your people. And so, Father, now we give the rest of this time to you. We pray that you would bless the reading and the hearing and the preaching of your word. You would give us ears to hear 
and hearts to believe and obey what you have written for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, if you turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 12 this morning. Matthew 19, verses 1 through 12. We saw last time how Jesus, in giving us the parable of the unforgiving servant, wanted to teach us one crucial thing, and that is that there is no forgiveness to those who are unforgiving, there will be no mercy. To those who are unmerciful. That if God who has given us this great inestimable treasure in forgiving us of our sins. If we do not show even a portion of that same mercy to others. We show we really haven't received it. We really haven't been saved. We really haven't been changed. So we don't earn our forgiveness by forgiving others. But we show forth the reality of our forgiveness when we forgive others. And so it should be a great it should be a great blessing in a way that you should grow in your assurance. The more you see yourself forgiving those who ask you and ready to forgive those who don't, right? Always having an attitude of praying even for your enemies, doing good even for those who continue to sin against you. That even as we do that, we show that we've been changed. We show that we too have received the mercy that we are now able to give to others. And it's my conviction that the more we see how much Christ has done for us, the more we will be ready to do the tiny little bits of mercy and forgiveness that we need to do for others. Well, in today's text, we cover a topic that touches every one of us, the topic of marriage, whether you're married now, whether you will be married, whether you have been married, whether you're single and will never be married and don't want to be married. Marriage still affects you. Marriage is the most foundational, most fundamental institution in society and it's the most foundational and fundamental institution in the church it's where God works among his people in fact a man can't be an officer unless he has his family in order unless he is the husband of one wife and so marriage is crucial for us to understand it's crucial for us no matter where we are to not only understand the purpose of marriage and the intention of it but how indeed it works and how we are supposed to proceed in our own marriages, if we are married, or towards married people and recognize the sanctity of that bond. Marriage is also a very difficult subject, a very controversial subject, because of the question of divorce. And that's the question that comes to Jesus in our text, as we see. If you ever want to get a minister in trouble, ask him what the Bible says about divorce. And that's really the reason why the Pharisees do it. They're, they're trying to get Jesus condemned as we'll see in a moment. But Christ answers the question, and he teaches us here, even though they weren't asking it with sincerity, he gives us a very crucial teaching on marriage and on divorce. And as Christians, we need to know this in order, again, to rightly serve him and to rightly glorify him. So let's pray for God's blessing as we turn to his word. Father, again, we thank you for your word, and we pray for your blessing upon it. Help us, Lord God, to judge ourselves by your word, and to judge all things by your word. Let us remember that your word alone is perfect, infallible, inerrant in all that it says. And so, Father, help us to rightly understand, to believe, to love, and to obey your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear now the word of the Lord from Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. This is God's holy and perfect word. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read? that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give... Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? 
And he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. His disciples said to him, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, all cannot accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. May the, war, the Lord establish this word in our hearts this morning, I pray. Amen. This is a fascinating passage. It's probably not one I would pick to preach on if I didn't have to. Because you get in trouble when you talk about these things. And that's the purpose for the test here. The Pharisees, it says, came to Jesus testing him. It's the same word as tempting him in Matthew 4 when Satan tempts him. Same word, test, tempt. And it's the same word in Matthew 16 when the Pharisees and the Sadducees came testing him, asking him to do a sign from heaven. Not as if they were serious, not as if they really wanted to know the truth, but they were trying to trip him up. They were really like the, the media is today for anybody who is a conservative. They're not really seriously interested in what you have to say. They want to trip you up. They want to show you, they want to show and expose you to be evil in some way and to, and to get people to, to stop following you, to cancel you, whatever you want to call it. But the Pharisees are not sincere. That's the point. They're trying to get Jesus to lose his momentum, to lose his, his popularity, to lose his standing, to lose his authority so that they can assert themselves again because they were not following him, they were not submitting to him and so he's a rival and they've got to get rid of him and we've seen them opposing him repeatedly and now as he crosses the Jordan and he's heading to Judea, the Galilean ministry is now over. Christ is going south for the final time. He knows that he's going to Jerusalem. He knows that he's going to die. And he's across the Jordan to the east of the Jordan where he's ministering. And it's still a lot of Jews were there. And it's the region of Perea. If he doesn't actually go into it, he's right next to it. And that's the region of Herod Antipas. And if you remembered, Herod has John beheaded when John says some things that Herod didn't like about marriage and divorce. Remember when he uh, uh, faulted him for taking his brother's wife because she divorced her husband to be with him. And so John's beheaded. So there's a reason why they're trying to get Jesus to say something that maybe it would get him into trouble here. And that's what this is all about. It's not serious. It's not sincere. And yet Jesus uses the occasion to give us a very important teaching on biblical marriage and on biblical divorce. And so let's see if we can we can follow this through and, and recognize what Christ is doing for us and how it blesses us. And so I want you to notice Jesus in his answer allowing for divorce. If the first point is the testing of Jesus, and that really is the first point, but it's not a sincere test. The second point is the allowing of divorce. The Pharisees come to Jesus testing him and saying, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? The issue here is the passage in Deuteronomy, which Pastor Appleton read earlier. There were two schools of thought in Jewish interpretation. There was the school of Shammai, which took a very strict approach. And it said that in that passage where it says that the man finds some indecency in his wife, some uncleanness, our translation says. The school of Shammai said that that has to be some kind, some form of, uh, of unchastity some form of sexual sin, and that was the only grounds for divorce, that there was something of that nature. The school of Hillel was the more liberal school, and they interpreted some uncleanness in the light of she finds no favor in his eyes. And they said that phrase, she finds no favor in his eyes, governs the uncleanness, and that could be anything. In fact, they listed a couple of reasons. If the wife burned the biscuits, I'm not kidding, the husband could divorce her. If she talked too loud in the house so that the neighbors could hear. This is another one that's listed that the rabbis would talk about. He could, again, divorce her for any reason. And so that's why they say it this way. 
Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? The word reason here is cause, accusation. It's the same word that's used when Pilate nails the sign of the charge against him, the accusation against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. This is the word. It's a technical term. So what's the cause that would allow a man to divorce his wife or would allow a woman to divorce her husband? What is the reason? What is the cause? What would be the thing that would allow that to happen. That's the debate here. And I want you to notice that what's interesting is both sides allowed for divorce, both Shammai and Hillel. There was no position where there could be no divorce. We know that that's the case today. The Roman Catholic Church actually doesn't recognize divorce. They have what's called an annulment. And your marriage can get annulled if it doesn't meet the nature of the sacrament, because remember, they call marriage a sacrament. And at some point... If you can show that it doesn't meet that nature, then the marriage can be annulled. But they don't officially allow divorce. And that's true for some Protestants, too. Some Protestant churches do not allow for divorce. And they don't believe that there can be divorce for any reason. In fact, there have been some, some godly ministers who, at least by all appearances, have been the innocent party in a divorce. I know one from a de denomination, a more charismatic-type denomination, where, the, where they don't allow for divorce. And if you are a divorced man, no matter what, you lose your ministry. I know of a, a famous minister who actually lost his ministry, even though it's clear that uh, he had not done anything wrong and that the wife was cheating on him. Uh, but the fact that she divorced him meant the end of his ministry. And some have said that, and some have looked at this passage and said, well, there shouldn't be any divorce. And they even notice where Jesus says, except for the cause of sexual immorality in verse 9 and they see the old king james and the old king james uses the word fornication and they say ah you see that's an engagement like joseph and mary had remember when they were not yet married but they were engaged and in that day and this is true the jewish engagement period was so formal that you did need a divorce to break the engagement and they say well it's for fornication fornication is for sexual sin before marriage therefore jesus is only saying there can be a divorce in an engagement but not in marriage. The problem with that is that misunderstands the Greek word porneia. It's not the word fornication. Porneia includes fornication, but it's all sexual sin. And so Jesus is clearly talking about marriage, and the Jews always understood it that way to be about marriage, and Jesus doesn't correct them here. So those Protestants who try to say that there can't be any divorce are simply incorrect. There is a grounds, it's in the Bible, and it's what Jesus calls here sexual immorality. And this grounds for divorce is given by Christ in this passage, and it's given by Christ in Matthew chapter 5, almost the same exact passage. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 that also for the cause of sexual immorality, a man can divorce his wife or a woman could divorce her husband in, um, in Roman culture and in our culture today. But it has to be for this particular ground. And the reason for that is, and, and all sides, again, Shammai and Hillel would have granted that. And the reason for that particular grounds is that sexual morality actually breaks the covenant. It breaks the covenant of marriage. And so the innocent party, the party who has not been unfaithful, has the right at that point to divorce. But what Jesus is saying here in verse 9 is except for that cause, if a man divorces his wife for something else, for some lesser thing, that he actually commits adultery if he takes another woman. Now, why is that the case? Well, I mean, you recognize it, right? Because God does not recognize the divorce. Man may give it, but God is saying there hasn't been a just cause. Therefore, they're not really divorced. Therefore, if either one of them goes off and marries someone, they're actually committing adultery in that act because God still sees the two of them as married, even though human beings may say they're not. And that's clearly the meaning of verse 9, and it's the meaning in Mark chapter 10 when Mark says this, and Luke chapter 16, 18 when Luke says it, and Jesus says it earlier in Matthew chapter 5, that whenever this divorce happens, when it's not biblical, that God doesn't recognize it. And therefore, when the partners go out and find someone else, they commit adultery. Now, I just want to expand on this a little bit. Because we get into um, a lot of questions that come up with marriage and divorce, and I think this is a good time to go into some of those things. Um, I guess I'll find out if that's the case or not. <laughs> but for example, 
There's no reformed minister today who would not grant that a certain level of physical abuse would allow for the woman to seek a divorce. In fact, we would even maybe even say that, that she ought to for her own safety. And remember, in Israelite law, if a man tried to kill his wife, he would be executed. And therefore, she would be free to remarry. And that's also true for adultery. If the adulterer on either side was caught and you could prove it, they would be executed. And so clearly remarriage at that point um, would be allowable. And so some of that's in the background here because under Roman law, the Jews can't do that anymore. And Moses gives this allowance for divorce. And the Pharisees try to set Jesus' view in the beginning of what the purpose and function of marriage is, which I purposely skipped at this point, and to contrast with this allowance of divorce that we see later on in, the, in his answer. And when they do this, they are not saying that Moses adds to the word of God. When they say, why did Moses? They know Moses wrote the word of God. But they're saying to Jesus, all right, if your interpretation of Genesis is correct, then why does God in Moses say in Deuteronomy that divorce is allowed? And so they're trying to get Jesus to be seen here as a teacher who is contradicting himself and wrong. But both the Pharisees and Jesus would recognize that what Moses wrote is the word of God. So don't let that throw you. Where, you know, they say, well, why did Moses say? As if that's against God's word. They know Moses wrote God's word. Moses, Moses wrote the part in Gen Genesis as well. And Jesus knows that too when Jesus says, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts. But notice where Jesus corrects them here. They say, why did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce? And Jesus corrects that. Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. Divorce is a permission. It's a permission from God, just as much as the original design for marriage is from God. But divorce is a permission from God, and it's a permission from God on account of sin. Because of the hardness of your hearts, divorce is permitted. It was not that way in the beginning. There would have been no divorce in the garden if Adam and Eve would not have sinned. There would have been no divorce in the human race. There is no divorce without sin. There is no divorce today without somebody sinning, either getting out of the marriage because they think they don't like this person anymore, they find their soulmate or whatever, or they're cheating, or the other person is, all the different things that people get divorces for. But there's always sin involved. There would be no divorce without sin. And so there is some kind of sin involved. And that's what Jesus is saying, because of the hardness of your hearts. Could you imagine if God did not allow divorce in this fallen world? What would men do if they didn't want to be married to their wives anymore? They would kill them. That's what they would do. They would make it look like an accident in the house, and they would kill them. That still happens a lot today. We watch those Dateline shows and stuff at night, right? How many times is it one of the spouses trying to off the other spouse, not just to get the insurance, but because of the court battle and the embarrassment of the divorce, and they don't want to go through that, and divorce is allowed, and we have no-fault divorce. And still this happens all the time. And so, in other words, God himself allowed Moses to write a permission for divorce because there's sin in the world. And so divorce actually is allowed in the kingdom of man to prevent, lesser e or to, to prevent greater evils, greater evils that would certainly happen if there were no divorce allowed. But divorce is only here because of sin. All right, that's what Jesus is saying. From the beginning, it was not so. All right, so what happens? I might as well cover this too. What happens... If you're a Christian and you're married, but you got divorced beforehand unbiblically, and Jesus says to go out and marry someone else is to commit adultery, and I'm not going to take away what Jesus said. What do you do now? Do you, are you supposed to divorce the, the wife that you're currently married to or the husband that you're currently married to and try to go back to your former one that you unbiblically divorced? Obviously not. What do you do now if you're in a situation like that? What do you do if you were the guilty party? If you actually cheated on your spouse and your spouse divorced you, and you go out now and you marry someone else, and maybe you weren't a Christian then, or maybe you were seriously backsliding. You know, David commits adultery, and he was a believer. What do you do now? 
Or are you supposed to leave the wife that you're currently married to now because you sinfully divorced or you were sinfully divorced then? Do you see how that would cause a problem? You would continually do that. You would break up now a legitimate marriage, okay, a marriage that, that shouldn't have happened but did happen and it's legitimate now. You currently are married to someone now. What you do is what you do with every sin. Divorce is not the, un, unbiblical divorce is not the unforgivable sin. If you find yourself in that situation, you repent of the sins that you committed, whether it was you that were the guilty party, whether you were guilty in that you divorced your spouse without grounds, whatever, you repent of that and you live faithfully with the person you are married to now, according to the word of God. That's clearly the will of God for your life. That's what you do. You live faithfully according to the word of God with the spouse you have now. You repent of past sins that you can't undo. Now, if you're separated and you're, you know, or even divorced and you haven't actually, either one of you haven't actually remarried, I think biblically then, since God doesn't recognize the divorce, that you should try to reconcile, unless there would be grounds there. But hopefully that's enough to give us some uh, full circle here of these teachings. And again, Paul adds abandonment. Some say, well, Paul adds Jesus. Well, Paul can't add when Jesus says this is the only thing. But Jesus is only dealing with the question they ask him about a man giving his wife who's there in the house a certificate of divorce. Paul's dealing with something else. What happens if an unbeliever actually leaves a believer in a marriage? What happens then? Is the believer's bound? Oh, I, I can't marry my unbelieving spouse has run off and married someone else and I'm stuck because, you know, it's not biblical. No, Paul says you're not bound in that situation. But that's a different situation. Here the husband and the wife are in the house. This is Jewish law. Only the husband has the, wife, the right to do this, this divorce. And he can only do it under these stipulations. In fact, Calvin says, and other scholars recognize this, the passage in Deuteronomy is given solely for the protection of the woman. That the husband could not just willy-nilly cast her off and then take another wife, and then maybe take her back again. He has to treat her as an equal partner in the covenant. God says, you have to have cause, you have to have a bill, you have to put it in her hands, you have to show that this has happened legitimately, and then you can never take her back. You can't treat her as some property, oh, and then take her back, and then get another, could you imagine, it'd be a license to just commit sexual sin. Men would be constantly divorcing and, and back and forth. So this passage, Calvin says, is solely, for the protection of the woman, that the man could not treat her in a way that he could just dismiss her at a whim, but that he has to have biblical grounds. And that's because, beloved, of the intention of marriage from the beginning. I want you to notice, thirdly, the intention of marriage from the beginning. And so this great, there has to be some great biblical thing. There has to be something, again, which a person has either left the situation or is uh, committing, again, the, the violence that, that would be even worse, as it were, of sexual immorality. Again, Jesus isn't looking at that idea. The idea is, for what reason can a man, when they're living together in the home married, divorce his wife? Obviously, if there's violence going on, things like that, someone's trying to kill someone, the innocent party should be putting the other person in jail, let alone um, being married to them still. But... We, we need to take a look at this, at the reason why marriage is so sacrosanct according to the word of God. And that's verse 4. He answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? That might be the most controversial verse in this text right now. It wasn't the case. It would have been unthinkable that there's anything controversial in there even 15 years ago. We say there is no male or female anymore. CNN, on March 30th of this year, I wonder if I can find the quote here, I have it somewhere, reported, March 30th, CNN reported, quote, it's not possible to know a person's gender identity at birth, and there is no consensus criteria for assigning sex at birth, end quote. We've left the realm of science. We've left the realm of reality. We're in fantasy world now, where you can just, with your mind, just create reality, whatever you want, and we're supposed to all play pretend that that's true. God made them in the beginning male and female. He did it that way on purpose. He didn't have to. When we read the account in Genesis, do you ever wonder, 
well, why does God do it that way? Why didn't, he just, why didn't he just create Adam and Eve together? He knew he was going to. Why didn't he, in fact, just create a billion people at once? I mean, he says to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. He could have made it so that the earth was full immediately. He could have made all the people that he wanted. He didn't need us to procreate. Why does he do it that way? Why does he cause Adam, as he's naming the animals, to see there's something amiss? There's something not good in the creation. Not that God made anything not good, but there's a divine pause there. If that pause would have been permanent, the creation would have been not good. But God pauses there for Adam to see his need of a helper who is comparable to him, who is equal to him. How could she not be? She's made from him. She is him. That's why scripture shows in the New Testament that when a man loves his wife, he loves himself. Matthew Henry says that while our children come from us, the children come from yourself, as a, as a dad, as it were, as he's speaking to the man, your wife is yourself, Matthew Henry says, and that's what the Bible says. A man who loves his wife loves himself. And so Jesus points out, God made them male and female, and he makes Adam see his need of the woman. And then he brings her to him. And he brings the woman to the man, just as when we do marriages, which we've just done one not too long ago, where the father brings his daughter to the man. God brings Eve, his daughter, to Adam, his son. And it's because they're male and female. For this cause, for this reason, man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The most foundational, the most fundamental relationship in this world is the husband to the wife. More foundational, more fundamental than parent to child. Because the parent to child relationship is to be broken for the sake of this one. Do you see it? For this cause, a, a man shall leave his father and mother. A, a, a child, or as we speak of our older sons, a man child shall leave because they're, you know, they're still in school and they're, they're men, but they're still sort of in our house. A man child shall leave his father and mother, shall break that relationship. The parent-child relationship is so close, yet it's designed to be broken. Your children are supposed to leave. Hopefully after 80, 18 or 20 years, you know, you don't want to get into the 25s, the 30s, <laughs> the kid in the basement at 40 playing the Nintendo, you know, you don't want that. But they are to leave. They're supposed to leave. In fact, when Robin and I were first married, our pastor Johnson over at our first PCA church in Harrison City would say that, you know, the children are just loaned to you by God. God is loaned. Your children are God's children, Ezekiel says. And he entrusts them to you for a time. And you are to train them. And you are to treat them as his children. But they're going to grow up and leave. They're going to become their own family. That's by design. They break the relationship of the parent-child by design so that they can be joined to someone who's not supposed to ever have that relationship broken. It's not made to be that way. God did not make us for divorce. As I like to say to Robin, it's you and me together forever <laughs> till God calls one of us home. That might be bad news for her. I think she got the bum part of that deal. See, that's why, guys, you gotta just get them married, get them quick before they change them now. But that's the, that, that is the reality, right? We cleave, the man cleaves to his wife, and the two become one flesh. And that's not possible with two men or two women or one man and a bunch of women or one woman and a bunch of men. It's not possible. Two become one flesh, and the proof of that is one flesh comes from them, children. And it, they don't come any other way. Children cannot come from the love of two men for each other or two women for each other. That love is sterile. It can never produce children. It can never be one flesh. It can never make one flesh. And even if there is polygamy or polyandry, multiple husbands, multiple wives, if there's children, it's still one woman and one man that made the child. A child can't have many fathers biologically or many mothers biologically, not possible, because the two make one flesh for this cause. A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. We know that genetically. We know that 
biologically. We know that according to sexual intercourse. But there's a oneness there, a uniting there that is beyond just the physical. And it's by God's design. God joins them together. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. The only grounds can be from God. And again, I know, I, I, you know it's, it's a messy world and it's a messy life. And some of you have probably been in unbiblical divorces. Then do what the Bible says. Repent of whatever you can repent of and walk faithfully now. But don't change God's word to justify what you've done. And you who are young and who haven't married, don't get into the idea that you can get out of a marriage that you're about to enter or that you have entered. You've got to, as a married person, recognize that barring the biblical grounds, which are serious and clear, you should never seek to divorce your spouse. I always say to couples when we do premarital counseling that when things get bad, and they do, you do have problems, you do fight, you do get in arguments, you do get in disagreements. When they do, you, the word divorce can't be on the table, ever. Unless it's the grounds have happened. If they haven't happened, it can never be there. You can never in your mind think, well, I can always divorce this person. Because if you allow yourself that thought, by Satan's temptation in your own flesh, you will not work on your marriage. You just simply won't. You, allow, you have an out. You're going to pursue that out. You're going to pretend like you're not. You're going to deceive yourself because you believe you can. As long as you're convinced by the word of God that you can't, that you have two options. Either I'm going to work on my marriage and it's going to get better, or I'm going to make my life a living hell until I die, you're going to choose option A. And with the grace of God, you can. You can heal your marriage. You can, by God's grace, even stay married to an unbeliever and experience God's fullness in that. But we have to trust God's word. And we have to seek his, his spirit. And Jesus is teaching this. And again, they're trying to make him, uh, they're trying to trap him in this and set him like scripture, scripture against scripture. But Jesus shows. He shows God's design from the beginning. And he shows the legitimacy that sometimes, yes, divorce does need to happen. But there's also a third category. And I want to cover this quickly. And that's when the disciples hear all this and they hear how strict Jesus is with divorce. He said, they say to him, and you know, it's hard to believe these guys sometimes, but verse 10, his disciples said to him, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it's better not to marry. It is not good to marry. They're literally, they're doing a play on words. It is not good for the man to be alone. They're saying it's not good to marry. Why would you do that? Why would you say that? Unless marriage is about you about your happiness, about your fulfillment, and unless you can get out of it when you feel like you should, why, I don't want to be in this situation. I just, just such, you, you talk about hard-heartedness. I mean, these are the disciples, and they say this. But Jesus points out, there is a situation, there, there are three, he gives three categories of people, and I just want to cover this quickly. Three categories of people to whom it's true that it might, that it is not good to marry, and that is the three kinds of eunuchs that he makes. Of course, a eunuch is a man without testicles. And so this would be a person who is born in such a way that they can't join with a woman or with a man. And that kind of person, sure, is going to be called to live a single life. And then there's the kind of person who was made a eunuch by men, could be by an accident. You know, back in those days, they would castrate men. But, but it, you have some terrible accident, which, again, you can't take a spouse physically. Both of the first two are physical. And Jesus is saying, clearly, people like that are going to have to live a single life. But there's a third category that's been misunderstood, and that is those who make themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is not talking about a physical making there. Unfortunately, there have been a few men who have actually castrated themselves, thinking that this is what they should do. Sometimes this passage is used to justify the um, monastic life or the, the life of uh, nuns in a convent, that this is a higher calling or something. Jesus doesn't say anything's higher than anything else here. He calls it a gift. Not all can accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. There are some people who are called to live a single life, who physically are able to take a spouse, but they're given the gift of singleness. Ordinarily, and I say this at every wedding, ordinarily it is not good for the man to be alone. Ordinarily, you who are young and not married, if you want to ask me what God's will is for your life, I'm going to say ordinarily, Barring that he gives you the extraordinary gift of singleness, ordinary, ordinarily the, the will of God for your life is that you take a spouse. If 
you're a man, that you look for a godly wife. If you're a wife, that you look and pray for a godly husband. You should be looking and praying for. This is God's will for your life unless he's given you the gift of singleness. And the only qualification really is that the person is a Christian and that you can, and I always say this if people ask me, it's, well, is it a Christian? Because if it's a Christian, then you can marry them, and that's the only thing that really matters. But secondly, is this a person, if you're, you know, you're wondering this, sometimes young people, they're dating someone, they're not sure. If you're a woman and you're wondering if, your boy, if the boyfriend is the, the man you know, that you, could, you should marry, then really seek the Lord and, and ask him, is this a man that I can submit to and show res the respect of a husband to for his sanctification and for mine? Will, will my full fulfilling the, the role, the biblical role of a wife, will that, will that be in this situation good for this man and me? Can I see myself being his wife in a biblical way that will draw us both closer to Christ? That's the question you ask. And if you're a man, it's the same thing. Can I lay down my life for this woman? Do I see myself being able to die to myself that she would become more like Christ? Your love should make her holy and without blemish, Paul says in Ephesians, which is the Christ in the church and the husband and the wife. The goal of the husband's love should be the sanctification of his wife. Can you see yourself living for this woman, even dying for her, that she would become more like Christ, that you would become more like Christ in doing it, that the two of you would draw each other, each other closer to Christ? The goal of a wife's submission is that her husband would be sanctified. The goal of a husband's love is that his wife would be sanctified. It's like anything else in life, that we would glorify God that we would enjoy him forever. That's what you should be looking for in a spouse. Yes, it's important to find somebody that you like, and maybe you're looking for somebody that, I don't know, some people like blondes, or some girls like a tall guy, or whatever. Sure, those things are important too. But it needs to be a Christian, and it needs to be somebody that you can glorify God with, and that's what you should be seeking. But barring that, if God has called you, and you are able to serve him, and you don't have this feeling of incompleteness and you really need a spouse. Paul talks about burning and it's better to marry than to burn. If you, can, if you have the continence and the ability to live a single life, then that's legitimate. You're not less than the married couple. Sometimes we emphasize marriage so much, but the Bible does talk about it a lot. But to serve God as a single person is just as legitimate, just as valid. I don't think Jesus puts anyone higher Paul does say the single person can actually serve God more in some ways because he doesn't have to worry about the spouse. But in serving the spouse, the married person is serving the Lord too. It's not like one is better than the other. But what you do is you look at your calling. You look at where God has you. How can I best serve him? Whether, again, you're married or you're single, the object is to glorify God, and that's what Jesus is teaching in this passage, that whether we marry or whether we stay single, that we are faithful to our calling, that we seek to glorify the Lord. Let's, let's close with prayer. Father, again, we thank you for this, this difficult teaching in some ways, Father, for our flesh. We, we don't want there to be things that are hard for us or, or that don't make us comfortable. And sometimes, Lord God, it's hard for us to obey your law for marriage. We may find an unbeliever that we want to be married to and we try to talk ourselves into it and that never works out well. Or, Lord God, we try to talk ourselves out of a marriage because we think that maybe we, we married the wrong person or something like that. Father God, cause us to repent from such things. Cause us to recognize that if we've been joined to a, to a spouse, we've been joined by you, and that we should seek to glorify you in that relationship, and that it can be a blessing and, and joyful for us if we do. And I just pray for anyone who might be struggling in a marriage, Lord God, that's difficult. Lord God, I pray you'd give them the grace to truly pursue godliness first themselves, that they would be seeking to be that spouse that you called them to be, that even when their spouse treats them poorly, that they would take seriously what you command us, Lord Jesus, to love those who hate you and to do good to those who spitefully use you. And Lord, how I pray that you would heal marriages, that you would restore marriages, that you would cause those marriages that are on the rocks among us, Lord God, again, by the repentance of both parties and whatever area they might need to, by their seeking you, by their drawing near to you, Lord God, that you would heal the marriages of our church. And Father, for those single people who are looking for a spouse, I pray that you would even now be preparing a good and godly spouse, good and godly wives for our young men and good and godly husbands for our young women. Lord God, cause them to draw near to you, to seek your will for a spouse and cause them to find it. Pro provide, Lord, what you have commanded. And for those, Lord God, who are single, 
and many of us, Lord God, in our church, widowed or widowers, Lord God, comfort them and allow them to be able to serve you, Father, in the place where they are. Let them be able to do so with joy, knowing that you are their God, that you are the one who completes them, that you have called them to this life, and that you will bless them in it as, again, they seek you. And we thank you in Jesus' name.